Yep. We can throw it up. Um, cool. So yeah, we can throw this up as whoever show. Um, so well, cool. So we're going to talk about Terrence McKenna and uh, Francis Yates and the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. And yeah. I understand you've got some um, you've got some thoughts on uh, on Johannes Andre who was apparently involved in the writing of some of the Rosicrucian manifestos, but this was a controversial thing when Brian Vickers wrote his critique of Francis yeah. Yates in Francis Yates and the writing of history. Yeah, well, I think it's it's a, it's a multifaceted issue because on the one hand, Yates definitely glosses over most of what Andrea actually says or actually believes. Um, I think, and I can't remember, I don't have a citation for this, but there either the Fama or the Confessio, they were able to identify that Tobias has, someone did one of those uh, sort of statistical uh, personality writing uh, analyses on it, that one of the digital humanities things. And um, Tobias Hess, who was Andrei's teacher at the time, and Andrei was young, he was like 19. His teacher wrote like uh, one of those things and it was based on another book that he wrote, Naumetria, which was sort of like a Kabbalistic eschatological, like the world is going to end in 1604 and the Pope is the Antichrist kind of Protestant work. And he, so he was one of the authors. And then Christoph Bessold, one of Andrei's friends, was also one of the authors. And I think they might have found some passages that statistically correlated with Andrei as well. So I, I, I don't think that it's, uh, clearly he was involved in some capacity but especially as he got older, like one of the ways I've read people interpret it is like between the age of 19 and then when he was 29 and he decided to really like commit to being a Lutheran priest. He had a very different attitude towards what he'd been involved in when he was younger. And then also the 30 years war was raging. So he was trying to distance himself as much as possible from that. But even the, the chemical wedding, the novel is like a satire of all the occultists who came in because I think they first and foremost saw themselves as like Christian mystics. But there were other things that Vickers said in there that I was like, well, yeah, like some of the things Vickers said in that article uh, were, were true, but then the slant was a little weird, like things like that there was no connection between John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica and the chemical wedding when the, the Monus symbol appears in the chemical wedding. So I don't really know I don't really know how you can argue that like it's like it's bigger than a citation like the, the image is like lifted and like put right there and then there's this thing with um Comenius Comenius was definitely involved he talked with Andrea so yeah so so it's like it's a it's a tough thing right like Vickers is definitely onto something in that like Yates is totally uh totally glosses over this whole aspect of Andrea and just sort of says like, oh yeah, the Christian uh, societies later on, she totally glosses over the Christian aspect and that they were really upset with a lot of the, the stuff. But at the same time, um, like he he also like is trying to say, oh yeah, and then Andrea I was never even connected. He probably was in some capacity. So it's, it's not clear. So yeah, it's like he was involved, but like he appears to be. So what do you? What's your take on this? Uh, he appears to be really critical of the movement, and he's satirizing it not to like celebrate the occult stuff, but to like Christianize it and try and kind of like is he trying kind of to like rescue it from the alchemical partisans or something? Well, I think his dad was an alchemist, so there definitely was like alchemical and paracelsian ideas paracelsus had a big influence on tobias hess but if you read the fama and the confessio they're very lutheran they're actually very christian documents and i think that some people like sort of read that aspect of the manifestos out or ignore it because they're they're actually just they're very against the pope and they also they say they're they basically make explicit one point we're neither catholic nor muslim uh or orthodox and so they're very much like Lutheran and there's a lot of I mean the the main character is Christian Rosenkreutz I mean you know like it's it's like it's a very much a like a a weird you know Christian mystic order allegory thing going on so I I think that to them they always saw it kind of like as Jakob Burma like Christian mysticism first and then hermeticism as almost being like this other aspect whereas I think that there were other people who were just really interested in either magic or gold making 
And these are the little curiosity brothers that Andrea is satirizing people either who were who wanted to who wanted to find some invisible college that will give them magic powers or who were looking for a way to actually turn lead into gold. I think that's who Chemical Wedding is really satirizing, whereas they would be more like almost not necessarily that they are uh, Bohemians, but they would be closer to Jakobuna and this idea of like a, a theosophical meditation, Christian theosophy kind of thing. So like, is there like the idea is that the puffers or the, the people who are trying to turn lead into gold or the charlatans and, and the fools or whatever, but there's a, there's a core of true adepts who know that the secret is spiritual, like in Burma. Kind, yeah, kind of, kind of like that. Yeah. But if you read like Christianopolis, Andrea puts theology above everything. Like theology is at the top of the sciences. So like there's this whole aspect where at the end of the day, it's like they are Orthodox Lutherans. Like they're interested in all of the hermetic arts, but when you really get down to it, these they're Christians before they're anything else. And they're really and they're really kind of like mundane pietist Protestant Christians at the end of the day. Like they're very, you know, of course they're interested in magic and alchemy and theosophy, but they are they're Protestants. And that's like Waite even says in the uh, introduction to the real history of the Rosicrucians, he's like, I'm so disappointed. I thought I was going to find some like really cool initiatic brotherhood. But instead, what I found was these are just really boring, like heretics, Lutheran heretics, because he was Catholic. So he saw them as heretics. So I, I don't know. I just think it's funny. Um, yeah. It, you know, in terms of this whole like the new historiography of alchemy thing, if this wasn't clear, I'll I'll, I'll lay it out for you here. So. You know, there's this paper called Some Problems on the Historiography of Alchemy from like the early 2000s, uh, Lawrence Principi and William R. Newman, who are like the sort of like head guys in the history of science approaches to alchemy. And uh, one of them recently wrote a book about Isaac Newton's involvement in alchemy. And and and, and the basic too long didn't read there is, is that Al uh, Newton was like heavily into alchemy, but not as like an occultist. It wasn't like a religious thing. Uh, contra like Betty Jo Teeter Dobbs's interpretation um, but like Newton just thought he was going to find the secrets of, of the cosmos and alchemy like thought he was finding the secrets of natural philosophy like you know physics and chemistry and whatnot um, and so um, crap what was I talking about I need to rewind to the I, I'm on a tangent I brought up new oh yeah the historiography paper so the idea is basically that like there's this this interpretation floating around in history that comes out of these occultist readings of alchemy that like the real alchemy isn't material it's not involvement with like trying to turn lead into gold you know it's it's it must really be spiritual right and they point at Carl Jung's uh, idea and I guess in Carl Jung's writing he didn't say like the essence of alchemy is this he says it's like it wasn't primarily about the material but it's kind of the same problem and so if you look at like marianne atwood in the 19th century and uh, this dude zuber has written a book it goes all the way back to Jacob burma and has kind of corrected um the the new historiography book um but but this idea that like alchemy can't really be uh, like in, in Burma it's like alchemy must be too important to be about you know just chemistry like because if it's about the world it's not about theology you know it's like it's got to be better than that you know um and so and then there's the idea that if if turning and lead into gold is all just the domain of fools and charlatans then well it must have some higher spiritual meaning or or it must have some psychological meaning uh, you know, so, I mean, it's like the Rosicrucians are sort of like contemporary with Burma. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we see in them that kind of spiritual alchemy that is sort of like, you know, the kind of thing that, that Principia and Newman are really uncomfortable with. But if you want to look at what Jung is doing and the way that McKenna is talking about how Jung made this discovery, you know, that there's a core of true adepts and that there's a, you know, higher meaning to alchemy and whatever, like, I mean, it is like a way that we, we can sort of like see how, like, what is it that he values about it? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that he he still values the material, I guess I should use, use this word values, you know, um, what McKenna values about alchemy. Um, 
because he still does value the like just like it, 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 there's he goes on these trips about the properties of mercury and how when he was a child he would hound his grandfather for his batteries he would break open the batteries and get the mercury and then play around with it and just like appreciating the like marvelous and wondrous properties of mercury as a kid before he had imbibed the ontological assumptions of science was this you know just kind of miraculous magical learning process and it's like he's he's trying to teach about what alchemical thinking is and explaining how like when he was a child he was operating as an alchemist and like what, what does that mean you know um so to like take inspiration from the rosicrucians is to take inspiration from the spiritual alchemy stuff as well as the the physical alchemy stuff mm -hmm. so you were talking about michael meyer um a lot and i think he's a really interesting figure to talk about in in this context of this link between spiritual and physical alchemy um but you were saying mckenna wanted to write a play about meyer yeah so i mean in yates you know meyer is one of the like sort of lieutenants of this alchemical conspiracy right or right. at least that's the way mckenna is explaining it i haven't you know I mean, I'm I'm not the deepest reader of Yeats and like the the kind of like fallout, you know, and, and where scholarship is at. I understand there's a book, Rose Cross Over the Balt Baltic by one Suzanne Ackerman I should be reading. Um but so so McKenna like fantasizes that like Michael Meyer apparently he like disappears from history around the same time as this invaded invading army moved in. Yeah, and he and Descartes was like a young soldier and part of this army or so that McKenna claims. Like I haven't actually gone and like, oh. you know, checked it out. But so he fantasizes that like Descartes and Michael Meyer like meet in an alley, and he's writing a play where these men like have a conversation, you know, sort of like a Tom Stoppard play or something where they're just like having an argument about the like course of civilization, right? Because because McKenna's looking back to this moment when you know Descartes takes over it and and like I think that it, he gets it from Francis Yates because he's like doing these alchemy lectures where he's having everybody read this book and he's prepared you know for the lecture by dog-earing this book and and Yates has this whole trip about Descartes and like contrasts hermetic thinking like alchemy is this like vitalistic thing and Descartes is 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 mechanistic you know, and, and McKenna wants to like advocate for a sort of psychedelic shamanism of a living nature. You know, it's like the earth is a being and it is talking to us, mm. um, you know, like through like psychedelic plants or like one of the, the signals. Mm. He points to the fact that like DMT is found in grasses everywhere and it's also found found in our neurotransmitters and like why are our neurotransmitters and plants there must be some kind of like planetary telepathic communication network going on you know right. so like it's it's easy to see why alchemy would appeal to him because like he wants to go back to this vitalistic thing and he thinks that like if we were to like just look at the world without the assumptions of science that are sort of like consider that, that have just declared vitalism to be heretical hmm hmm that's fascinating. I think that um, in the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, she does talk about Descartes uh, en enlisting in the army to go fight in the Thirty Years' War. So that does happen. So he, he would have gotten that from there. And uh, she does make a lot more of Michael Meyer than... I mean, it's tough. Like, Meyer is a very ambiguous figure because he definitely was not involved. Someone Also, someone discovered his autobiography, like... 20 years ago or something and uh Harroward Tilton Tinton I can't remember his Tilton. name Tilton wrote the the quest for the phoenix which yeah. is a, which is a, like a really which is a great like resource and puts all, puts like all of this stuff into context and I think that kind of uh, polemic against uh, my guys Newman and Principi by the way oh really you have noticed yeah like he he really takes those guys to task and like He's really mad that they want to like rule spiritual alchemy out and thinks they're like oppressive and shit. It's, I mean, it's kind of like a great example of the sort of thing McKenna is talking about. Maybe I should kind of get into that, use him as an example, mm. you know, where he really reacts. And he's part of like a, a, a number of scholars who react against that, saying, well, you know, these guys in the history of science, like they're not interested in the spiritual stuff, but like, 
you know, some of my alchemists in the 17th century really did think that the like spiritual alchemy is more important than chemistry. So what do you think about that? You know, it's like, right. We still need to study this stuff and, and whatever. And and I don't think that, that Newman and Principi were trying to rule that out and they don't deserve it, but there is this like backlash that's happening. And, you know, McKenna says, and he never gets to it as far as I know, but in the Esselin lectures and the ones that I sent you the link for that you can read the transcript, um, he's like, there's some factions who don't like Francis Yates, and we'll get into this, you know, but he never does. Right. He never really, it's funny, he never really gets into the Yates uh, vision of Giordano Bruno. Uh, he's more yeah. into the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, like escapade, you know, that whole adventure, because he sees this as like a model for psychedelic counterculture, and he wants, you know, in terms of like concern of like the like material consequences of this stuff, you know, it's not just this navel gazing spirituality where he's encouraging people to like project the contents of their minds onto the flask you know mm. um, and like do union individuation and like it's that's it's like part of it you know but he's trying to like get people to like think outside of the ontological assumptions of modern science like go back to this this garden you know go back to the alchemical he literally says that we, we need to go back to the alchemical garden mm. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. Because I remember that about Tilton's book uh, is the whole thing about Golden Rosenkreuzer and like trying to find this lineage that would tra trace Jung back to Golden Rosenkreuzer. And I think like the whole the whole thing with Jakob Burma is like, yeah, there were ever ever after that, at least in, in the West, there's there's spiritual alchemy. So I, I don't think you can argue that it doesn't exist. But I mean, I, I guess the real question is like, what status does that have for the for the creation of science? Oh, but one thing that I did notice from some of your transcripts was the whole thing, and this does come from uh, Giordano Bruno in the Hermetic tradition, is this idea that Descartes' um, methesis, uh, methesis universalis, his, uh, his method, uh, the invention of analytic geometry was inspired by Hermetic mathematics and hermetic mathematical speculation okay um, yeah i remember like something about that but i didn't know that it was specifically the hermetic mathematics yeah well this is the thing and this was something that uh peter forshaw uh, i've heard him talk about it about how um the th this is one of the biggest main critiques of the eights thesis is this idea in a couple of chapters in giordano bruno and the hermetic tradition she talks about that uh, mathematics, uh, the hermetic mathematics may have influenced the creation of modern mathematics, the creation of analytic geometry. But even in the chapter on magic and science, because I was, I was reading it recently, actually, she says that the nature of, you know, the hermetic mathematics is Pythagorean and it's sort of numerological and qualitative and that the modern mathematics is abstract. So she was saying that this is, these are, this is obviously a huge paradigm shift, but then she makes the argument which she returns to in Rosicrucian Enlightenment, which is basically Descartes sought the Rosicrucians, was influenced by his ideas, and biographers of Descartes attest this. Well, maybe not influenced by their ideas, but at one point was intrigued by the phenomenon. Um, uh, but then later on uh, went on to invent an entirely new kind of mathematics, and so his speculation is he absorbed some of these hermetic ideas, and this led to him creating the new uh, kind of mathematics. And, uh, you know, I think like on the one hand, the general scholarly consensus on this has been, oh my God, what the, the one thing that I've never, like what hogwash basically, but the one thing I've never read and I don't, I mean, this might exist and I've just never encountered it because I'm not, I'm not an expert in this field, obviously, but like the, uh, a historian of mathematics commenting on this, uh, on Descartes' invention of the, of the coordinate plane, because, um, there was a really interesting article in the New Atlantis in this journal that was published uh, a couple of years ago about the extendable compass. He invented an extendable compass because he was trying to resolve certain math problems relating to the quadratrix of Hippias from Alexandria. And these had to do with the Archimedean spirals and all of these math problems associated with squaring the circle, which also is a huge... Uh, uh, there was the, this uh, book attributed to Roger Bacon from Dee's library 
about the quadrature of the circle that people in Rosicrucian circles at that time made this huge fuss about. So there's a, there's this whole there is this whole mystique around that math problem. And Descartes did actually invent analytic geometry through trying to solve a bunch of problems associated with that math problem. So I that's something that I think would be really interesting if a, like a real historian of mathematics would go into that and actually comment on that. Because I think people have sort of generally said, no, the math stuff is all hokum. And it's like, well, you actually you might actually be able to make that argument. It might actually be a good argument, you know. But people... And that brings us back to Michael Meyer, of course, because one of those emblems, was it in the Italian of Fugians, is the, the squaring of a circle, right? Yeah, no, that's true, yeah. Um, so what more can you tell me about the squaring of a circle? I, I think I might use that as like an image if I can get it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I can get access to it, right? Um, you know, the rights to it or whatever. I don't know how that all works, but I'll just talk to my editor. Oh, you mean the, that, that image from Atalanta Fugi games? Yeah, you know, and just use that as like a, you know, image for the um, for the chapter and maybe refer to it. Um, well, but I think if that... there is, can you give me the article that you're referring to? Or like, who is the squaring of the circle stuff in Yates and the in the Rosicrucian Enlightenment? I can just go look it up. Okay. Um, it's in, a, a, there's a specific book about Roger Bacon. Um that uh, was came from Dee's library uh, that was important to Rosicrucian speculation. I will have to find uh, this exact title, but so that's a primary source about uh, the quadrature of the circle. And then in terms of secondary sources about Descartes, honestly, most of this stuff I've learned through reading the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So it's not the best uh, their article on Cartesian. Oh, no, that's a good source. That's fine. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'll, ch I'll check it out in the SCP. Um, and then, cool. uh, yeah, and then for the for the emblem, for the Michael Meyer emblem, I'm pretty sure that's in the public domain, but there is Adam McLean's lovely colorized version that you can get on his website, of course, and maybe that you would ask his permission to use. But um, in the, and I know in that, in that passage of Adelanda Fugiens, Meyer is citing a specific, I don't think it's Avicebron. It's a specific Muslim uh, philosopher, though, who who describes that exact method for the quadrature of the circle of being you draw Adam and Eve, then you draw a circle, and then you draw a square, and then you draw a triangle, and then you draw a circle again. That specific inscription uh, as representing the quadrature of the circle and representing the philosopher's stone. It, it comes from a, an Arabic source that I can't remember right now. Oh, okay. Um, and and he so he just he took that from that source and put that right in there. And um, the, have but you read the, that book by the way on on Michael Myers uh, sources? There's a really cool book by H. M. E. De Jong. Is it? Um, uh, uh, sources of Michael Myers Book of Emblems. It's it, like this incredible, the really, the really big one, right? The, yeah, it's like this incredible, like deep dive into all of the different alchemical texts that, like, he's referring to. Yeah, I, I really yeah. need to get a copy of it. I've only like had a library copy. Yeah, me too. I I've I've seen it at like the Embassy of the Free Mind, but I've never actually like I I haven't I don't own my own, so I never had the chance to go that deep into it. But yeah, that's an amazing an amazing study. Yeah, absolutely. Probably just gonna like copy it all out by hand at some point so I can have it in my notebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bootleg copies of uh, library books. Yeah, I used to like take photos of stuff, and now I need to search out like where I have it on some old, you know, hard drive or whatever. But I have like whole photos of books, you know, <laughs> a whole a whole books worth of photos of books. It's so much it's data. Crazy. Yeah, it's so much data. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, I'm doing the Philip K. Dick part of my thing. And it took me forever to find this one quote where like Dick had this like Kabbalistic vision, you know, where he saw like numbers and letters rearranging themselves. Luckily, a friend of mine pointed me to this like recording that I had kind of just like skipped over the two minutes where it happens, you know, and like ruled it out and it was there, it, you know. Um, but like it was a good thing that I did because I was going over this one McKenna lecture and McKenna tells a story where his machine elves are like printing letters and he sees letters as if Hebrew or Sanskrit letters on the sort of like elf balls that are flying around the room when he dra drags the DMT trip into the room or whatever. And so, you know, I'm doing the comparison with Philip K. Dick's interest in Yates and, and I'm going to like 
pipe in this um this narration of that that tr vision that he had you know and just kind of make a point about how these guys were all sort of like turning to this material to understand mm. experiences that they were having you, right. you know um but but like experiences that they were having that they like were using to like push the boundaries of metaphysics you know and, and like philip dick's theory of time was really important to mckenna and like you, you know like his his whole theory of time even after the like time wave mathematics was debunked he, he still hasn't like given up on it he's still clinging to that um and so like throughout the alchemy stuff like he drops the name of Henri Bergson and, and like he 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 thinks that alch alchemical language is going to help him to explain his theory of history and his theory of time and, and whatever. And and like time is really important to Plato, you know, like for Plato, time is the moving image of eternity and whatever. So, you know, like McKenna's got all this like erudite knowledge of like theories of time and ancient philosophy, you know, and um I wish that I could do more with it, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have like this quick, quick little bit about how both Philip Dick and Robert Anton Wilson also read Francis Yates, but mm. they kind of had like different interests, you know, mm. um, and, and Wilson, I hadn't found much about it, but then it turned out there's an interview like late in life by the guy who's like writing a biography now oh. propping on. And uh, so like, Wilson does give like a summary of what happened in Yeats, you know, and I should have put that up front now that I think about it and not save it to the end because that like helps to orient the reader on what, mm. what Yeats, what Yeats is theory is supposedly what, you know, that way I don't need to like quote from her at length. I can quote from, you know, Wilson, who was an influence on McKenna, you know, who like, might have gotten turned on to Yeats by reading the cosmic trigger and seeing the reference to mm. Yeats in there, you know. Mm. Yeah, I, I, and you also did you have that like the footnote at the end of Vallis in there too? Um, yeah, there is like three quotes from Vallis that I want to use, uh, which is about like the Hermetic alchemists were looking for this entity made of information known as the homoplasmate. And it's like a science fictionalization of of alchemy, right. you know. And and he, he, Giordano Bruno's in there, and and it can only like the idea. First of all, the idea of like Giordano Bruno being hermetic is sort of like a recent invention of Francis. You, you, you know, you wouldn't have ever yeah. thought of Giordano Bruno as hermetic if you know you hadn't read Francis. You, you know, Giordano Bruno never says I'm a hermetic thinker, right? <laughs> uh so like dick must have read yates you know and it turns out that pamela jackson who published the exegesis and has read the whole unpublished thing you know she found a reference and it turns out um that kw jeter who's another sci-fi author who's still around um he i've got his boba fett novelizations burning a hole on my shelf um he had lent a copy of the rosicrucian enlightenment to pkd hmm hmm so, you know, I realized like that must be um, the reason why in Vallis and the appendix we've got this alchemy stuff, you know, and um, there's this hilarious bit and stop me if you've heard this one from me before, uh, where Dick is like, Giordano Bruno is my main man. In oh, the yeah. Jesus. <laughs> you have you have told me this one before. Yeah. <laughs> And so it's it's like my whole project is like unpacking that, you know, I, I need to, I'm going to make a note of that because I need to use that in uh, in my paper. Well, this, this whole thing about Meyer and uh, Descartes, this play that McKenna was supposedly writing, I mean, that's dynamite. Yeah, isn't that great? I mean, it just like in terms of my argument, you know, like the way he's making creative use of this material, you know, it's like, he, he's inviting his audience to create an alchemical language. And I've even like retitled my chapter, you know, creating an alchemical language. Cause I think that helps, you know, it's like, he sees it as like permission and empowerment. Hmm. And uh, there's, there's like a quote where he says, you know, this gives us permission. Um, like gives permission to psychedelic thinkers, you know, just like, in the same way that like psychedelic experience, you know, I'm, I, 
and I need to figure out a way to like reference Alan Watts. Like I'll quote something he said or something, you know, the idea of like the distinction between self and world is something that Alan Watts trips about. And, and I, and I'm mentioning Alan Watts as somebody who used alchemy as like a metaphor. Um, and, uh, and McKenna says, you know, like alchemy, like broke down this distinction between self and world. And, and at one point when he's talking about the, uh, the Jungian idea that, they're entering in a, a sort of like a waking hallucination by you know being in the hot lab like focusing for 40 days and and you know you just start sort of sort of start hallucinating um and he says uh that these were like meditation practices designed to break down the boundary between waking and sleeping well he says practices designed you know um and i, I think he means you know like esoteric meditation practices right um practices and so here here's an example of something where it's going to raise the hackles on the back of the necks of the new historiographers you know um who want to say well alchemy is really primarily about chemistry you, you know um we're, we're getting into the domain of spiritual alchemy here but like i think in terms of like writing a book about terence mckenna and esoteric studies it's good to like look at that uh you know as the um the hallmark and and you know you've reminded me of the tilton book which I should really use as like an example of the backlash. Mm, mm. You know, there's another thing in terms of chemistry and alchemy is I, I believe that Meyer only uses the term chemistry to describe what it is he does. He doesn't want to describe himself as an alchemist, even though, really? Meyer, yeah. It, it, and so this is already something that's sort of in the zeitgeist, even though Meyer is not really of the same party of like, well, obviously, Boyle's Skeptical Chemist would be a couple of generations later. That's when that's published. But even at the time, Ben Johnson is writing The Alchemist, the sort of satire of De Meyer is definitely much. He's both he's he is a, a chemical practitioner. He does real laboratory alchemy. But if you read his literary works, they're suffused with spiritual imagery, of course. I mean, that's why everyone still, you know, uses them to this day for that purpose. Um, but, you know, another thing that I, you know, in, in the Tilton book, he talks about, because Meyer does go to England. That's another confusing thing. Meyer goes to England. Um, and so Yates turns that into this whole thing that he's like some kind of agent provocateur of the Rosicrucian movement, even though he'd never heard of the Rosicrucians when he went there, according to his uh, autobiography. And then when he's in England, you know, he was highly rejected by the Royal College of Physicians and they basically treated him like a quack, a quack doctor. They were like, we do not, because he was friends with this guy, Francis Anthony, who really wanted to create Aurum Potabile, potable gold, which was a, you know, the goal. And so, yeah, I, I mean, you, you've read Tilton, so you, you, you already know all this stuff, but like, it's, it's very, very, I don't know. I think it's, it's interesting because it's not, Meyer was a spy. That's what's so confusing about this like he was a spy he was involved in all of this political stuff he was you know there was all of this this intrigue going on and yet it's like his his motivations for going over there were were you know it's not like ooh, rosicrucian cabal quite as much you know well that's that's important though i mean like the fact that it really was a spy you know i mean like there's this whole trip from robert ant wilson about how like bullshit you know is a mix of like truth and fiction right. right truth and lie or truth and con or you know whatever it is and like when you're thinking about mckenna's like bullshitting method and, and it's like ultimately i do want to like import into religious studies a way of thinking about his kind of bardic rap and the way that he's like playing fast and loose with the material you know it's it's not as if he's not getting license from mckenna to do the sorts of things that brian vickers complains about it, it, you know and it's like I think in this way, you know, we might consider his lectures on alchemy like as like university level, you know, kind of quality uh, lectures is just like from a kind of like a metaphysical, ontological like mm -hmm. standpoint that wouldn't be compatible with, with the modern university, you, you know, but it's like, it, it, why is that, mm -hmm. you know, and he's kind of like demonstrating why, you know, you can't, you, you kind of can't do lectures on the history of alchemy trying to understand alchemy's use for advocating psychedelic shamanism you know like that's like the way that you're involved in it you know the way that you're taking a, a, a interested stance 
is something that like you couldn't get away with teaching in that way in, in the academy and it, he thinks that that's a problem you know he thinks that that kind of prohibition is like keeping us from having open minds um so man thanks so much for 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 being here we only have like two minutes left are there any other things that you you're saying or you're thinking of from what you spotted in in your reading um, well, it's only that the quadrature of the circle really is about the relationship between quantity and magnitude. And it's a very old math problem. And when you talk about the history of mathematical analysis, which is the the domain that Descartes invented, arguably, you can sort of project the history of analysis backwards and read the history of math anachronistically. I'm saying things that would make real historians of math very angry. Um, I have I have friends who get very angry when I talk this way, but but um, you can view these as linked math problems. And there is a link between the quadrature of the circle, even as it was conceived by the Greeks and possibly by the Egyptians and Babylonians. We don't know. The record's kind of patchy. People make arguments about it um, and how and how that evolves. So there is I, I think that that's that's the biggest thing that I've been coming to recently is that you know, there really might be something to the Yates thesis after all, at least on the mathematical level mm -hmm. um, that everyone seems to have just overlooked. Um, but I love this idea of the Michael Meyer Descartes play. Um, I, I mean, if you can point me to anything else uh, with that. Well, unfortunately, his library and papers were held at Essel and burned down in a fire. So oh. like, oh, but, you know, Kevin Whiteside's, uh, I'll find you the link and I'll, I'll pass it along if you want to look at his his library. We like know what all the books were in, in his library, at least, you know, um, we, ha we have like a list of titles. But yeah, that's it. So um, it looks like our, our, our video is up. You want to throw it up on YouTube, send me a link and I'll, I'll post it. Okay. Uh, so people who are reading and along um, can follow the thread. And man, I really appreciate the feedback. That helps me a good deal. Yeah, of course. Good luck in the submission. Cool. All right. Cool. Appreciate okay. it.